All right, well, um, I am Josh Footer, the University of Georgia Cooperative Extension Agent here in Cherokee County. And with us today is uh, Dr. Stephen Mim, professor in the Franklin College of Arts uh, in the History Department, also director of undergraduate studies, and probably most importantly, uh, a hobby apple grower and collector of close to 100 varieties of apples uh, in his personal collection. Uh, and I've had the pleasure of getting to know him over the last couple of years, uh, working on uh, a grant with the uni uh, USDA, um, seeking to preserve uh, some of the lost varieties and some of the rare varieties of uh, Georgia apples. And so he's going to cover uh, the history of apples in, in overall, uh, but uh, specifically here in Georgia as well. So uh, Dr. Mim, thank you and look forward to hearing your talk. Sure. Thank you. And thanks to everyone for being here. Um, and, and thanks to Josh in particular for being a collaborator and co-conspirator on this project, uh, which is now in its third year, um, originating with a USD grade, USDA grant, but has become um, somewhat more ambitious and, and more focused on Georgia in, in the past year. So I want to to give everyone a sense of how the history of apples might inform uh, this particular project, I want to begin by, by looking at what most people here in the United States experience uh, when they think of apples. The average consumer in the United States. This is your local Publix or Kroger, and it, it neatly shows you a choice of perhaps three, four, maybe five, if you're lucky, varieties of apples. Most obviously or typically Gala, Red Delicious, uh, Honeycrisp. Uh, you might also see Granny Smith and Fuji and perhaps a couple more. <clears throat> These varieties alone in the United States make up approximately two thirds of the apples that you can buy at a national supermarket chain. But that kind of narrow selection is, is, is true of the world at large as well. A total of approximately 20 varieties make up almost 95% of the world's apples sold to the end consumer. This state of affairs, which most of us, myself included, uh, except without question, at least until recently, uh, is a profound and radical break with centuries of human history. In fact, millennia of human history. At one time, the diversity of apples in the United States, as well as elsewhere in the world, was legion with astonishing degrees of variation within particular regions, never mind nations, and also variation by function. <clears throat> so these apples that you see here are basically fresh eating apples, but you're supposed to cook with them if you're going to do that as well. But at one time, apples were grown for very specific purposes, from drying them to applesauce, pies, cider, brandy, so hard liquor, fresh eating, of course, dessert, frying, vinegar, uh, and other uses. But the world we live in today is a one apple fits everything variety, um, and the functions are, are effectively obliterated. And this project that Josh and I are working on aims to recover just a hint of that diversity, specifically the regional diversity here in the Southeast and in Georgia. It is not, I wanna emphasize an exercise in nostalgia where we're trying to revive old things just because they're cool and old, uh, but because the apples here in Georgia have a future and have potential applications that go well beyond uh, questions of historic preservation. So let's, to understand how we get to this, let's step back and, and look at where apples came from. Um, and all apples that you eat today uh, can trace their ultimate ancestry to this very specific location in the world, the Tian Shan Mountains in Kazakhstan on the Chinese border. This is a, a very unique ecosystem that has actually sadly gotten much smaller in recent decades, but still exists. But it's an ecosystem of wild apple trees that you can see here in full flower on the sides of the mountains. That we now know that this was the cradle of all apples is a, is a testament to modern genetics, but it's also a reflection uh, 
of uh, Nikolai Vavilov, who was arguably the most famous Soviet geneticist and plant uh, scientist of the 20th century, who quite early in the late 1920s came upon these mountain orchards of wild apples and concluded correctly that this was the center. This was the, 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 the Garden of Eden, if you will, for apples uh, from which all domesticated varieties flowed. Vavilov, shown here, um, is an interesting character and in, in, in very much operating or was operating in the spirit that this project uh, operates and that he was the founder of one of the first modern seed banks. He was interested in all plants, not just apples. And the Vavilov Institute remains today in Leningrad as one of the premier uh, kind of arcs of genetic biodiversity of, of plants, both wild and domesticated. Vavilov, in, in identifying this, this region as being key, nonetheless did not fully understand because he was operating in the, in the advance of, of modern genetics, did not fully understand like why this particular place became so crucial to the rise of the modern apple. We now know, though, that this region <clears throat> had a very unusual set of ecological pressures that gave rise to the modern apple. And if you, if you visit it today, um, you'll encounter a couple things, one of which are large furry creatures, bears, but also on the right, the actual apples. And before I get to the bears, I want to point out that this is, these are the actual apples that you can pick. And if you look at them, they don't look that different than crab apples and domesticated apples that we consume today. They taste different though. And what is their, their most noteworthy quality is their sweetness. They are not um, particularly tangy. They're not tart, they're just sweet. And the fact that they're so sweet is a credit to our ursine friends here on the left, because scientists have speculated, and I think this is hardened into um, conventional wisdom at this point, that over many years, apples have been in this region for 12 million years, over, over the millennia, bears effectively selected the apples off the trees that were the sweetest and ate them, and then defecated. <laughs> and spread the seeds. And so they were uh, pressure on the apple to become sweeter and more desirable because the original apples of the Tian Shan Mountains are like the size of a peanut and tasted absolutely terrible, all right? So the bears were our sort of first cultivators of this. Of course, humans eventually got involved and this is where the proximity of this ecosystem to what's known as the Silk Road is so important. The Silk Road connects East and West and the Tian Shan Mountains lie at the juncture of, of, of one of the key exchange points between the two regions of human civilization. So as people moved east and west along the Silk Road, they began picking the apples to eat them along the way and in the process spreading the seed still further, not through intent, but just through happenstance. Along the way, if it went east, you, you begin to get what are known as Chinese sweet apples, which are a, a distinct subgroup and really the closest thing that we have today to the original wild apples. In the west, by contrast, the apples of the Tian Shan Mountains got crossed with native crab apples to Europe, which injected the first critical infusion of genetic diversity into the apple that allowed it to become this thing that we know and love today that is both simultaneously sweet and oftentimes tart as well. And it eventually spread throughout Europe. This um, process was, was aided and abetted by the invention approximately 3000 years ago uh, in a couple different places, China, Babylonia, of the idea of grafting, which is to say taking cuttings from trees that are yielding particularly desirable fruit, grafting them onto roots so that you grow a clone of the original parent tree. And this enables the spread of distinct varieties. It also allows for the kind of pressure 
driven breeding that will soon become uh, one of the key features of apple cultivation. So instead of cultivating them and spreading them by seed, there's this growing tendency toward grafting as we move from the original origin point west uh, into Europe. And you can see here on this, the uh, ways that the original apples crossed with wild crab apples, particularly the crab apple known as Malus sylvestris in Europe, which is sour and firm, two qualities largely missing from the original apples. By the time of the Roman Republic, Roman Empire, you begin to see uh, intent, uh, intent, like intentions of, 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 of cultivating apples in a very deliberate way. And we have archeological evidence to back that up. This is a Roman mosaic from an area in France. Recall that, that once the Roman empire spread, it would ultimately encompass much of Europe, large swaths of, 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 of the Mediterranean basin and even go far as Great Britain. And this particular apple that I'm showing you here, the Anurka apple is thought to be the apple described by Pliny the Elder, a Roman writer uh, in, in, in the beginning of the last millennium. And it is grown today, even now in Italy. So this mosaic here shows you people picking apples. It also in another tile shows you people grafting apples um, as, as evidence of this kind of cultivation. Now, just to revive all of your dormant memories of, of American and world history here, something very critical happened. The Romans, of course, collapsed. Their, their, their empire fell into disarray in the fourth and fifth centuries AD. And eventually the era that we know as the Dark Ages, uh, the medieval era settled over Europe and much of the old ancient learning and um, <laughs> civilization itself kind of fell into disarray. However, for our purposes here in the United States, the key event that helps explain why apples became the ultimate American fruit can be traced back to this incident here, the so-called Norman Conquest in the year 1066. Apples had spread and been grown in parts of France, especially even during the Dark Ages, and especially in the area that we call Normandy today. This is a sub area of France, uh, it's still famous for, for a lot of its apple products. And when the Normans invaded England successfully in this year and defeated um, the Anglo-Saxons in the battle known as the Battle of Hastings, they brought with them apple cultivation and introduced them into Great Britain, which is the beginnings of the kind of apple varieties that are ultimately going to cross the Atlantic many centuries later when the British begin to colonize North America. Before that happens, though, several other things are going to take place that are going to make apples increasingly desirable, not only in England, but also when they arrive here in North America. The key um, is that um, most people really didn't eat apples a thousand years ago for the purposes of fresh eating, the way that we eat them today, where they want a nice, pretty looking apple that's covered with wax at their local Publix. They instead cook them, uh, or increasingly in Normandy and then in England, turn them into alcoholic cider. In the late medieval era, uh, inventors, some nameless inventor, came up with the brilliant idea of crushing apples um, using this, this clever horse-drawn millstone that revolves around a central axis and can very effectively turn huge numbers of apples into, into liquid gold uh, with relatively little human effort. Because if you can imagine before this, the kind of labor it would take in uh, to crush apples manually by hand to get the liquid out. And this enabled the, the growth of a cider industry in England, that from about 1100, 1200 AD onward begins to grow. And cider is really going to become the drink of choice, the alcoholic drink of choice, but the drink of choice period for many British people. 
It's a lot easier to make than beer, which requires wood fires to malt the ball, barley and boil what's called the wort. Uh, cider is a lot lower input in terms of, of its requirements for the purposes of, of churning out alcohol. Um, and England becomes a nation, before it became a nation of beer drinkers, it becomes a nation of cider drinkers, alcoholic cider, which by the way, has the added advantage of not being um, prone to harboring microorganisms that you might find in drinking water drawn from a well. Not that people understood the germ theory of disease, but they seemed to grasp that cider was, was, was largely immune from that problem. So as you go on, this is from 1678, by which point the colonies have already been established. The English are really kind of pioneering a lot of the modern methods of cider production. And it makes sense then that when people crossed the Atlantic in the very early part of the century, that apples came with them and cider followed very quickly. We can find, in fact, as early as the 1620s, uh, just 10, 15 years after the first settlements, we can find reference to apple trees growing <clears throat> for purposes of cider production in the British colonies in, the, in this period, the early 17th century. Now, while grafting was being used in England at this time, What's fascinating about this shift to the colonies is that grafting is a kind of tough thing to pull, pull off when you're bringing trees across the Atlantic on a sailboat, all right, uh, sail, sailing ship. You need a, a way to, to get apples into the ground quickly without the fuss of that. And so they resorted back to the old fashioned method of planting seeds uh, because virtually any seedling apple tree can produce serviceable cider. That's what out the wonder of alcohol. It can, it can turn even the worst, most disgusting tasting apple into something at least that you can drink. So that set up a situation when they started planting these seeds from Britain, where a vast, unintended, uncoordinated growing experiment took place where apple trees were being planted and it set the, the stage for trees to emerge serendipitously that are, were good, not because of grafting, but just because they were crosses with, with existing varieties, or in some cases, native North American crab varieties as well. So it, 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 was, a, it was an uncoordinated breeding program, <laughs> unintentional, but by the end of the 1700s had given rise to a number of varieties that farmers began to select purposely and graft that were especially good and better than the average seedling tree. It's worth noting as well here that in North America, uh, by the end of the 1700s, early 1800s, Americans were drinking cider in quantities that really have no parallel in modern human history. In other words, we were a nation of lushes. We were a nation of heavy, heavy drinkers. Uh, by one measure, for example, I believe the 1820s, uh, every man, woman, and child per capita drank an average of five gallons a year of the equivalent of 200 proof pure alcohol, which if you calculate it out, how many six packs that is, is, is a really rather remarkable amount. So you can see this show up in all sorts of other ways, namely that um, as people move to North America and begin to move in and settle the interior, and you can see here the areas settled gradually over the course of the first 150, 160 years of settlement, you see not only the rise of apple trees, but you see a huge number of cider mills as well. So uh, by one estimate, one out of every 10 farms in New England by 1776, date of the American Revolution, had their own cider mill, okay? Not, I mean, everyone drank cider, but they actually had their own cider mill, one out of 10. So cider making became part of the American lexicon, part of the American tradition. It was America's drink. Beer was not a significant uh, potable at this time. It was not a drink that was particularly widely used 
uh, in the early 19th century. And in many ways, the story of that century is the rise of beer very gradually and the very slow, very slow, very gradual decline of cider. Two other points to make about the uses of apples for alcohol is that one, there was apple brandy, which was distilled in the conventional method of, of using heat. But the second uh, was a method used in New England uh, in which fractional uh, distillation by freezing. So you would put out your, your cider, your alcoholic cider and let it freeze in the winter, take off the ice, which was pure water and it would leave a more concentrated beverage. And slowly you could yield a very potent headache inducing beverage known as Applejack, which was a kind of, of, of liquor made from apples, but, but made in an entirely different way. Now, this is, this is something that's unique to the Northeast because obviously in Georgia, we don't have those kinds of temperatures. So as time goes on, you're gonna see um, apple varieties beginning to spread from the Northeast, but also um, new varieties emerging in places like Virginia. Um, and the history of apple cultivation in the South, the Southern United States necessarily focuses on places like Virginia, because that is the first area to be found, to settled actually in 1607 and two, Areas like Georgia, the back country of South Carolina, the back country of North Carolina are not going to be settled until much later. So many of our, the founders, people like Jefferson or Madison, um, had significant plantation holdings, as we know, like Monticello, and in places like Virginia, pursued apple cultivation uh, with considerable enthusiasm, again, specifically for the purposes of making cider. So this is an image here of the reconstructed orchard of Thomas Jefferson. And what's different about this area, I suppose the Northeast, is that when they began planting British apples and began planting apples that were starting to come out of New England, they quickly encountered a problem, which is that the apples that flourished in, say, Sussex, England, or Maine, Massachusetts, were not necessarily going to thrive and do well here in Virginia. So if you look at um, apple variety listings in colonial Virginia, say from 1755, and I'm using a specific example here, you're going to see that there were approximately 22 varieties listed, only seven of which had been locally developed. The rest were English, European, New England, you name it. 40 years later though, after the American Revolution, you see nursery ads where all of the varieties virtually with a couple of exceptions are local Virginia made varieties. And they're made that way precisely because of the growing preference for apples that can thrive in the higher levels of heat and humidity that are typical of anything below the Mason-Dixon line. These guys were obviously obsessed with apples. And as you can rem remember, like this is this period of transition from European or New England varieties in the South to Southern varieties is coinciding exactly with the tenure and influence of people like Madison, Jefferson, Washington, George Washington, all of whom began to develop these popular varieties, many of which were used specifically for cider. And it was, it was Jefferson, for example, who developed what remains uh, several key cider apples that are now revived and being put into use in places like Virginia for artisanal cider production. Now, our area of the South, as I've already mentioned, is different. It's not, it's not part of this Tidewater, uh, Virginia gentry landscape. Our part of the South here in Georgia is more akin to what you find in the back country of North Carolina, Tennessee, even parts of Alabama uh, and South Carolina. And as people moved into these regions, as the map on the left shows, after the American Revolution, 
and really began settling um, the entire trans-Appalachian frontier, they were settling it and typically uh, largely through convenience or because of convenience, planting apple varieties once again by seed. Uh, one of the premier researchers of Southern apple varieties, a man named Creighton Lee Calhoun, who sadly passed away this past year, put it well when he described our part of the country as a region defined as a vast agricultural experiment station, crudely screening seedling apple varieties, rejecting most, but keeping the best. There are millions of trees being planted in, in this area that you see on the right, that's defined in part by the, the presence of the so-called five civilized tribes. Um, and these varieties then became the basis of many of the known varieties, extant varieties of historical apples that um, are with us today. And that this particular project that Josh and I are working on seek to revive. It's interesting because Jefferson actually as president um, encouraged this uncontrolled breeding experiment because he promoted the idea that Indian tribes could be assimilated into American society, which for him meant not only kind of intermarrying, but, but adopting white uh, conventions of dress and, uh, and all importantly, agriculture. And so he encouraged government agents to distribute apple seeds to people like the Cherokee uh, to cultivate them and, and, and become orchardists and agriculturalists as well. What's interesting about the Cherokee is that we, we don't know a huge amount about what they did with these varieties. We know that they had huge numbers of apple trees and peach trees, as well as other fruit trees too. I have seen quite recently, actually in the last couple of weeks, uh, evidence that the Cherokee were not only growing seedling varieties, but had started to move towards self-conscious cultivation of specific cultivars via grafting. Uh, that, that there actually seems to be a small amount of evidence that that was already well underway by the time of what's known as Indian removal, the tragic and forced wiping clean of this region of, of people of native descent under, under threat of force by the US government. And so when they were pushed out, the Cherokees and other members of, of the tribes here left behind settled landscapes and an, an astonishing number of fruit trees that they had, it seems, potentially deliberately planted and deliberately selected for certain qualities. And this became a kind of ghost town and whites moved in to this territory that the federal government had cleared. You can see here, this is a land warrant uh, that is showing an assessment of how much a particular native person's land was worth. And, and one of the things they look here is the apple trees. That's on the penultimate line here. Um, I think it's 22 apple trees at uh, 99, 90 peach trees, and you know, so they've, they've kind of calculated that that out. So we, this sort of evidence exists everywhere. We and we have very detailed granular information on just the degree to which the Cherokees have become so accomplished as as orchardists at this time. The other people who have come to realize this or realized it up very earlier, much earlier than I did, was a first generation of settlers who had an interest in botany and fruit cultivation as well. One of the people who moved into our own state of Georgia, who is of considerable importance in this larger story, is a man named Jarvis Van Buren, actually a distant relative of Martin Van Buren, the, the president who, who succeeded Andrew Jackson. He moved from New York to Clarksville in Habersham County. His, his house still stands today. And he became obsessed in the 1840s and 50s with the apple trees that flourished in the South that he was finding on these abandoned Cherokee lands. And he founded what's known as the gloaming nursery that was uh, an attempt to bring some of the best of these varieties to larger attention. Uh, Van Buren um, 
wrote extensively to Southern agricultural magazines. And you can see here, if you read at this, um, some of the apples that he identified and sought to promote, some of which uh, he gave names based on Cherokee place names. So names like Tiliqua, Tekoa, Kulazaga, Yahula, actually all of these are, 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 are names that, that derive from Cherokee, uh, the Cherokee language. And he started to differentiate between these varieties. And most important of all, he began to, to graph them and, and cultivate them quite deliberately <coughs> and introduce them. But one way that this, these varieties began to spread here in Georgia, and similar efforts incidentally were underway in, in North Carolina that he participated in as well, was through a growing number of societies, state level societies like the Pomological Society of Georgia, the Horticultural Society of Georgia, who began to pool their knowledge together in meetings. Um, and there were several other men who were fascinated by this subject, one of whom was named William White, who lived in Athens, Georgia, attached to the university. Uh, Prosper Jules Berkmans, founder of the, the Fruitlands Nursery in what is Augusta, Georgia, and the area that eventually became the, the site of the golf course. Um, and another individual, uh, Silas McDowell, um, who was like Jarvis Van Buren, obsessed with trying to take the Cherokee varieties and pull out the best the best and the brightest, if you will, of these. And you can see here his rather romantic account of discovering them, preserving them. And the two images here from the late 19th, early 20th century are watercolors done by the United States Department of Agriculture of just two of the varieties that he claimed and, and propagated that would eventually become part of the repertoire of apple varieties that Southerners could grow in places like Georgia, Alabama, North and South Carolina, and the like. The way that these varieties ultimately gained a wider audience and didn't simply remain obscure Cherokee artifacts has a lot to do with the development of, of a set of Southern nurseries that were by the time of the 1920s, enormous in their influence. They, they had various names. There was uh, the Franklin Davis Nursery in Virginia. Uh, Joshua Lindley was another man who opened one outside of Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, Lindley's catalog, for example, um, Turner Century listed 169 apple varieties. Davis listed 269. But the most important of all of the growers in the South was the Prosper Berkman's nursery, which was known as Fruitland. And you can see here, the, the apple varieties are, are legion. There's so many of them. Some of these are ones that we've propagated in the orchard up at Blairsville. Some of them sadly are extinct. They may be ultimately refound and rediscovered. But it is to, to Berkman's, I think, that we, we owe a huge debt to taking these from being even regional, uh, of regional interest and making them of, of national and even international interest. Because Berkman's at its peak, Berkman's operations at its peak was, was shipping trees as far away as Japan. This was a, a huge, absolutely massive nursery operation encompassing far, far more than apples. Although apples was, was one of the, of the key fruits for Prosper Berkman's and the Fruitlands Nursery. Uh, here, as you can see, an earlier uh, Fruitlands Nursery catalog, everything highlighted uh, here in yellow, incidentally, are apples that are now extinct. Though, I wanna make a pitch to everyone listening to this, just because they haven't been seen for a century doesn't mean that they don't still exist. And one reason we are able to grow as many apple varieties as we can now has a lot to do with the work of pioneers in this field, like the Creighton Lee Calhoun, who went out and actually talked to old folks in the mountains, was able to find ones that had gone extinct and recover them and restore them. We hope certainly that, that some of these can uh, once again take their rightful place in orchards in the South, if not elsewhere. 
Fruitland's Nursery from 1897. So again, you just kind of get a sense of just the, the, the degree of variety that people could choose from when planting apples at this time. Again, the sharp distinction in contrast with our options today. This is Franklin Davis's uh, nursery catalog, very similar. Uh, you know, this is the one that's based in, in Virginia, Richmond and Baltimore and uh, Maryland as well. Um, but I wanna focus our attention on what is, what is a key part of the story here that, that goes beyond what say home growers would do in buying things from Fruitlands or, or others. Um, which is that the growers that were working uh, and selling these varieties were in many ways operating the way that uh, baseball teams and, and the sport of baseball is played today, which is to say that varieties that, that, that enjoyed a very local influence and were popular in say a small town in North Georgia became of Nash of statewide and regional popularity in this by by moving from like a farm team to the major leagues by virtue of being recruited by these growers and identified as having particularly valuable characteristics that made them well suited for for whatever purpose or intent the grower wanted. And so a lot of these varieties that were, were extraordinarily obscure, whether they derive from the Cherokee or not, kind of moved up the food chain, no pun intended, to, to the Fruitlands catalog and then became quite possibly, you know, grown not only on a, on a significant scale for home growers, but here for commercial growers as well, which is where the story takes a, a particularly interesting turn for the state of Georgia. <clears throat> if you went back to the 1890s, the South, despite growing apples in every backyard, was not known as a, a, a place of commercial cultivation. Um, and this was a product in part of the fact that the infrastructure, literally the railroads, were not yet into these communities in the mountains or the Piedmont that could grow them well. And as a consequence, there wasn't really a market like if you plant in an orchard, you wouldn't be able to get them to market. But with the advent of the railroads by around 1900 into some of these more remote mountain towns and communities, you begin to see that change. One of the first commercial orchards in Georgia was founded um, by HR State, um, Demarest, and he ran a general store in the town. Uh, one of his customers, as the story goes, had run up a bill, couldn't pay cash, and so ceded the deed to some mountainside land on a hill, 30 acres, as a way of discharging himself from the debt. At the very same time, State had also acquired some apple trees that he was hoping to sell through his general store, and he couldn't sell them, and so he just stuck them on the hillside, and lo and behold, he had the first commercial orchard in Georgia, the Yona Orchard Company, uh, Demers, Georgia. And you can see here two images of it uh, that shows some of the apple trees he was growing, Yates, the wine saps, Shockley. These are, these are three very mainstream Southern varieties, although good luck finding them at Kroger. Um, and he was soon followed by other, even more famous apple growers. In Rabin County, for example, John Reynolds of Clayton County, uh, Clayton, town of Clayton, who was also publisher of the local newspaper, the Clayton Tribune, began to promote the county's apples at the state fair and through the pages of his newspaper. Um, so too did uh, John Fort who was a grower in Rabin County, who developed a series of apples, including this one here, Fort's Prize, and it's called Fort's Prize. Why? Well, because it won uh, first prize at the Spokane, Washington National Apple Show. And this event, probably more than anything, was what put Georgia suddenly on the apple map, uh, both within the state and outside of it. What was so striking about these early growing efforts is that when they would show up at these national competitions, they invariably showed up with varieties that no one had ever seen before. Fort's Prize was, 
was something that uh, John B. Ford had found growing. It was, it was some antiquated backyard variety and he cultivated it, propagated it, and then won first prize. So this became a real, you know, kind of rags to riches story of apple cultivation. Here's John Reynolds, whom I had mentioned. Uh, and you can see here two images of his kind of PR effort. There were the county fairs, which are obviously a critical component for just getting uh, local recognition, but it's far more significant for the purposes of commercial cultivation were the, the state ag fairs uh, that would take place in middle Georgia. And Raven County here has its contributions and with apples prominently displayed um, and, and would oftentimes take home the, uh, the top prizes. Raven and, and, and some of these other more remote mountain communities um, were certainly important in apple cultivation, though it would be Habersham County in particular that would play um, a significant role in really trying to mass produce apples within the state of Georgia. You can see here um, one of the um, big I wouldn't call them corporate players, but this is Lewis McGee, who's like an Atlanta businessman, buying up mountain property, which was dirt cheap at the time, starting to turn out staggering numbers of apples to try to, to turn Georgia into a significant apple variety, uh, apple exporter. And he too, incidentally, won prizes. I believe I have a picture of it. There it is. Uh, he was Habersham County. Uh, he won first prize at the International Apple Shippers Association conference held or meeting held in Niagara Falls, New York. I believe he won with a Grimes Golden, a variety of apple that he was growing in pretty significant quantities at this time. Looking at these varieties, the commercial varieties, I'm not talking any longer about what Aunt Cora is growing in her backyard. I'm talking about what Louis McGitt is growing in his massive operation. What's so striking is that these commercial varieties that he was embracing are almost, almost without exception, utterly unknown, in some cases extinct today. So it's, it's you know, the, these were huge numbers of trees that are now gone. Uh, so if you look here, for example, at some of these, you know, Kathy's sheep nose tree, the, the, the Yahula, the Yap, uh, these are gone, uh, despite their former centrality to apple cultivation in the state. And this raises an important point, and it's a question Josh and I oftentimes get. There is a instinctive belief that if something's old, it somehow must not have been good enough to hold its own with modern varieties, you know, must be misshapen or not taste good or, you know, that, that progress always moves in one direction. In fact, all of these varieties are delicious. The only thing that some of these varieties have going against them is that they don't ship very well 3000 miles, which is why the varieties that we know and eat today and buy at our, our grocery stores, we eat them because they're largely good at being shipped. It's not because of the flavor. We get them from Washington state, they make it across the country. These probably taste significantly better. In fact, I can, I can say from firsthand experience that, that the ones that still exist do taste better. But the, 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 the downside is the shipping, but that is not what this project is about. We're not trying to like ship apples to Washington state. We're trying to revive an indigenous, local apple industry that had commercial import at one time. And, and while we cannot turn it back into what it was, these certainly should be grown for other purposes, such as cider and, and more niche, niche ends. So why did this all fall apart? Well, like many speculative bubbles and many people pouring money in, there were too many more apple orchards planted in parts of the South, all throughout the South. This is true of Arkansas, Georgia, North Carolina. So that supply ultimately far overwhelmed demand. And as you move toward the 19 teens and 20s, you see a growing kind of speculative angle to this where people like this ad are building consortiums of investors 
to plow capital into the development of orchards. And though that worked very well for establishing the orchards, it didn't necessarily work at ensuring that there would be a market uh, in, in the 1920s and beyond. Uh, and by, by, by 1920 alone, you can see that there's clearly too many apples being grown in Georgia to meet that, to, to, that they're, they're far in excess of the actual demand. Here are two graphs I want to quickly show you for those of you in the audience who may come from some of these counties. It gives you some sense of, of the overplanting, especially in Habersham. This is uh, taken from the United States census, which gave very granular data uh, on every single farm within the United States and how many apple trees they had. They also cover everything else from peaches to pecans, everything. But Habersham had um, over a thousand trees per square mile in, in Habersham County, making it one of the most um, densely planted apple counties in the country. Closest one is Gilmer, which obviously still today has a significant place in the, the, the agritourism apple business. Uh, and here it is broken down by another metric, apple trees per capita, sort of looking at the number of apple trees relative to the labor force. And this, this brings the graph down to something a little more sane, but also still captures the degree to which apples were so concentrated in a handful of counties. And that has everything to do with this over planting that took place in the speculative boom of the teens and 20s. Nonetheless, if you look at, at the numbers here, you know, counties that you might not think of as being significant apple growing counties, Forsyth County, Stevens County, uh, nonetheless uh, had a not inconsiderable number of trees per capita, just as much as, as they had it in terms of square mile. You know, no one thinks of Cobb County today as a big apple growing region, but they still got probably about 100 trees per square mile at this time. So what, what happens to our story of diversity, eclecticism, and, and variation? And the answer is that in the 20s, as, as the center of production in the United States begins to move decisively to the Northwest in particular, um, you see several things happening that are coincident with this. One, household production of apples, that is for home consumption, declines precipitously. It declines because people are starting to buy what they used to grow. So that eliminates a good chunk of the diversity right there. That goes hand in hand with urbanization, the rise of cities who obviously are not growing their own apples. As you see a national apple market emerge, it makes more sense for national apple growers to have a handful of varieties that they can put all of their eggs in that one basket because there are economies of scale that come from growing 10 varieties versus 100, just simple fact. Think of the spraying regime, you know, if everything comes into bloom at once, it's much easier to take care of that. In addition, uh, some of the, the national nurseries, not, not Fruitlands, but, but Stark, for example, Stark Brothers of Missouri, begin to market miracle varieties that they've identified as being especially suitable for everywhere in the country to be grown. Golden Delicious, Red Delicious, two varieties that are with us today and you can oftentimes find. Uh, this is a national apple variety. Never mind that it grows terribly in many parts of the country. Never mind that the Red Delicious in particular is like biting into a kind of sh sugary piece of cardboard, but nonetheless, that's, that's, they, they have many other qualities that make them very good for shipping. And that's why the, the focus begins to zero in on this. As a consequence, Stark Nursery Catalog only lists a few apple varieties. The rest start to go extinct. Uh, if you're up in Blairsville at the research station, here's an example. Pride of Summer. This was an apple grown commercially in Blairsville, Georgia, near the research station. Hasn't been seen for a century and it went extinct at this time. As this, the focus shifts to these handful of national varieties, the very same varieties that um, have dominated and continue to dominate our grocery stores 
even today. So uh, for those of you who might be interested in reading more uh, and learning more about old apples, I, I, I encourage you to, to start with this particular book. I've mentioned Creighton Lee Calhoun before. Uh, he was the one who produced really the first survey of known Southern apple varieties. And this book was then updated significantly after the identification of many of the so-called extinct varieties and remains for people like me and Josh, the Bible, if you will, of Southern apple cultivation and preservation uh, that, that, that the ambition that is very much at the heart of this grant and this project. So thank you for coming today. And I, I hope to see all of you in person at some point in the not too distant future. Thanks. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Mim. Thank you.